Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of Day One at Showcase. My name is Yazan Bule, and we have a cool afternoon lined up. Our first talk is from Michael Lodato at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and he's going to be talking to us about the human uh, brain and its aging, and the title of his talk is Understanding Human Neuron Birth and Death Using Single Cell Genomics. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thanks to all of you for, for being here. Uh, I'm very excited to, to be here and be a part of the Allen Institute as a, as a next gen leader. So, um, today I'm going to talk to you about mutations. And I think uh, we all can appreciate that inherited uh, mutations uh, across individuals can drive phenotypic differences from, from uh, benign differences like facial features and height to serious uh, differences in trait like the traits like disease susceptibility. And current estimates suggest of the six billion base pairs in our genome, any two human individuals differ by uh, approximately six million uh, single nucleotide variants, or SNVs. Um, and it makes sense that these six million SNVs can influence traits so strongly because we know that the genome is foundational to all programs cells of the body need to execute, both during development and uh, in aging. Uh, but the kind of mutations I'm going to tell you about today are, are different from inherited mutations. They're somatic mutations, called somatic mutations because they occur in cells uh, of the body after fertilization. So they're mosaic, being present in some but not all cells. And we've known for some time that somatic mutations can occur basically at any stage of human development, including uh, in very early pluripotent cells of the, of the early embryo, giving rise to clones of cells that distribute across the body. For example, in organs like the brain, the lungs, and the heart, representatives of the ectoderm, uh, endoderm, and mesoderm that split uh, from each other at gastrulation at about the second week of development. Um, and somatic mutations can occur later in development as well and become restricted to a uh, given organ like the brain or subregions of, of an organ like the brain, for example, one hemisphere or even a subhemispheric region. And the reason why we've known about these clonal somatic mutations for some time is they can sometimes be causal in specific human diseases. For example, hemimegalencephaly, like I'm showing in this uh, green cartoon here, where one side of the brain overgrows relative to its normal anatomical size. Uh, hemimegalencephaly can, in some cases, be caused by gain of function mutations in genes uh, that drive cell growth in a population of cells uh, restricted to this hemisphere. But aside from these one off examples, up until recently, it's been a total mystery exactly how much the genome varies from cell to cell in the human brain. And this is a question that uh, I just thought was really interesting. And in the past few years, uh, while I was a postdoc in Chris Walsh's lab at Boston Children's Hospital, was what I focused my research on. Um, and I just thought it was a really important question and an important gap in our knowledge because we know that uh, variants that distinguish people can so strongly influence traits. And I thought that by understanding exactly how the genome varies from cell to cell, we might understand something about uh, the function of the brain. And it's, it, the reason why we had this gap in knowledge uh, until recently is because this has been a, a difficult problem to study, because traditional whole genome sequencing methods are really underpowered to study mosaic variants. So you can imagine if you wanted to comprehensively study mosaic mutations across the genome in a, in a tissue like the brain, you can isolate a sample of, of brain tissue, harvest DNA, and then perform whole genome sequencing on that tissue. And if you did, you might find loci like the three loci depicted here, where you have the majority of whole genome sequencing reads colored totally gray because they perfectly match the human reference genome at this site, um, but you have a subset of reads that have a red uh, colored box indicating a mismatch in the genome. So it's not all of the reads, not half of the reads, it's not a heterozygous site, but it's a subset of those reads. And you might have this at a few different loci with different levels of, of uh, potential mosaicism at these loci. But from these data, it's really impossible to understand the underlying population structure uh, of the cells you're studying. So you can imagine in one scenario uh, where you have a population of cells that are unmarked and have a, a pristine, no, mutate, no somatic mutation genome, uh, colored gray, uh, another population of cells with the blue variant, and populations of cells with the red and pink variant. Another possibility is you have a set of unmutated cells, blue cells, uh, pink cells, and then purple cells that have both the, the blue and the red variant. A third possibility out of a potentially infinite number of possibilities, probably, um, is that you have un, you know, unmarked cells, blue cells, red cells, and no pink cells, because this pink variant was just a sequencing artifact that occurs all the time, and it was a variant that was supported by a single read, um, and it was just, just a red herring. While at the same time, you missed an a ultra-rare mutation, this yellow mutation that existed in a very small number of cells, maybe even in a single cell in this person's brain. So you, these are totally invisible to standard whole genome sequencing techniques. So to circumvent this, 
myself and my colleagues uh, adopted a single cell whole genome sequencing strategy. And I'll walk you through uh, the, the way that we did that. So from fresh frozen post-mortem human brain tissue, uh, we lyse that tissue and collect nuclei. Uh, using flow cytometry for the panoramic marker nu n, we sort single nuclei into single wells of 96 well microtiter dishes. And then within each well, we perform a whole genome amplification, yielding microgram quantities of DNA from the picograms that come in with each nucleus. Um, and this uh, order of magnitude amplification we know comes with some level of noise and artifact, and we're always uh, cognizant of, of, of keeping those artifacts in mind and thinking about ways to improve our, our, our pipelines. But from that DNA, we have enough material to do quality control experiments, whole genome sequencing, and subsequent validation. And so from those, those experiments, we can uh, find evidence of mosaic mutations in the human brain. So what I'm showing you here uh, is, uh, is a set of data from four samples from one uh, normal 17-year-old individual, uh, whole genome sequence data from the bulk heart of this individual, uh, mapping to the Q, uh, Q arm of chromosome 18. And we can see, like in the example I showed you earlier, all the reads at this site are colored gray because they perfectly match the human reference genome. And we can say the same thing for a neuron isolated from this individual's uh, prefrontal cortex, neuron 24, appears to be homozygous reference. But for two neurons isolated from the same small 50 milligram uh, sample of tissue, that's not the case. Both of these neurons appear to be heterozygous uh, for a, a thymine instead of a, a guanine at this box site at the center of the plot, suggesting that this is a somatic mutation that occurred in some progenitor of these two neurons and that was inherited by them upon terminal differentiation. We also identified putatively unique somatic variants. So again, I'm showing you whole genome sequencing data uh, from the same individual, uh, now uh, from the p-arm of uh, chromosome two, where we can see again in the bulk heart, this individual appears to be homozygous reference. And in two neurons from the prefrontal cortex of this individual's brain, neurons 12 and, and five, we can say the same thing. Uh, but one neuron, neuron six, appears to be heterozygous with one allele uh, being mutated from an A to a G. So we can't, and you never rule out that this mutation is not shared between other neurons, but this is a, a potentially uh, unique variant that's present in one and only one cell in this person's body. And so uh, profiling these kinds of mutations genome-wide with uh, my collaborators Molly Woodworth, another postdoc from Chris Walsh's lab at Boston Children's Hospital, and Semin Lee, a postdoc in Peter Park's lab at Harvard Medical School, uh, a few years ago, we performed the first ever genome-wide estimation of somatic SNVs uh, in normal cells, focusing on neurons of the prefrontal cortex in the human brain. Um, at that time, we relied on uh, no, uh, you know, well-validated but uh, mutation callers that weren't necessarily designed for our single-cell data. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to identify somatic variants distributed across the human autosomes. Here are 16 cells from one, uh, one individual. Uh, we identified across these three individuals that we studied, so a small sample size in this first estimation, about 1,000 point mutations per genome. Uh, and these mutations sometimes disrupted genes that were important for neural function, and had they been uh, mutated in the germline and present in, in uh, all cells, had the potential to cause human disease. And so I'll talk a little bit more uh, later in my talk about overall rates and patterns of somatic uh, mutations in human neurons, because we subsequently expanded our our sample data set and also refined our bioinformatic analysis. But from this, uh, even from this early estimation, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, what we were able to learn uh, about human neural development using these mosaic mutations. And so going back to our example of um, inherited mutations in the germline, we know that shared mutations across populations can trace lineage and migration patterns of our species across the planet. Um, and I showed you uh, evidence that we can also trace ancestry within the body using clonal variants in neurons. So we scanned across our data to see if we could find many clonal mutations in, in human neurons. And indeed, we found a set of 15 uh, single nucleotide variants that were shared at uh, different um, percent mosaicism across these 16 cells that we sequenced. And I color coded them. Um, to, to depict which uh, cells these variants were shared in. And you can see even from this um, very um, small data set, we can make inferences about how cells are related to each other. So we can tell that neurons 2, 77, and 24 might be more closely related to each other than they are to neurons 6 and 18, because they share a set of mutations and, and shared a progenitor cell that had these mutations um, that uh, is not shared with these two neurons. 
So we wanted to continue to use these mutations to trace lineage uh, across the brain, but not necessarily do more whole genome sequencing, which is uh, expensive and time consuming. So we just did a very simple genotyping assay uh, for these, this set of loci across an additional 210 neurons isolated from that same individual's brain. And using those data and scoring every cell for a positive or, or a negative for these given variants, we were able to draw this lineage tree of 160 neurons that tested positive for at least one of these somatic variants from a normal individual's drain, brain. So drawing this uh, developmental phylogeny of, of cortical neurons in the human for the first time. And so I'll walk you through this plot. So we're showing basically all 160 cells that tested positive for at least one of these somatic variants. Uh, those cells depicted in light gray tested positive by simple genotyping, and those in dark gray were whole genome sequenced. And we can infer from these data that all the cells depicted in this plot were derived from an initial founder that lacked somatic mutations because there's no single mutation that uh, links all the cells uh, from the brain. Uh, but we know that at some point, a descendant of this initial founder gained mutation A1 because we have a population of cells around 20% or so that tested positive for mutation A1, including genotype cells and sequence cells. A different descendant of this initial founder gained mutation C1 and using uh, 11 clonal mutations, we were able to reconstruct nine cell fate decisions across this, this lineage um, using these somatic mutations, again, as, as lineage tracers. And work um, led by, by Molly, we wanted to understand how these mutations might distribute broadly across the brain. So now knowing the, the loci that we we're interested in, now we can do sort of a bulk DNA a uh, whole genome sequence-based assay to ask what percentage of mosaicism do each one of these mutations have in, in uh, bulk tissues. And so we found that in the prefrontal cortex, as well as in the temporal cortex, so around the sp spinal cord, uh, these variants were present in, in relatively high mosaic fractions, so between 5 and 20 percent of cells in all these tested areas uh, had, had these mutations, these widespread A1 and C1 mutations. What we were really surprised to see is that these uh, mutations escaped the brain, so they're also present in high mosaic fractions in the aorta and the heart, derived from the mesoderm, and the liver, lung, and pancreas, derived from the endoderm. <clears throat> and we were surprised by this because we assumed that these mutations that were mosaic in neurons must have occurred in a neuroprogenitor cell in, sometime during neurogenesis, but these data completely contradict that. These mutations couldn't have happened in a neuroprogenitor cell and also be present outside the brain. They must have happened much earlier, so in the pluripotent cells of the early embryo, uh, which divided to give rise to more pluripotent cells, enough to distribute across all three germ layers during gastrulation, again at the second week of development, and send representatives uh, across uh, several organ systems. So that if one were to analyze a, a small area of the cortex dominated by this pink A1 clone, you would find uh, these pink uh, neurons intermingling with blue neurons, green neurons, unmarked neurons, and purple neurons, such that a pink neuron in the cortex might be more developmentally related to a pink cardiomyocyte in the heart than it is to 75 percent of its neighbors in the cortex that it functions with and synapses with uh, throughout life. So I think this is sort of an interesting proof of concept about the kinds of analyses and, and, uh, of human cell lineage that we can now do in the human that are analogous to lineage tracing experiments that uh, you all are very familiar with um, in, <coughs> in the model organisms. And so moving on um, from development, I was also really interested to know whether somatic mutations continue to accumulate after birth in the brain. So um, I showed you that somatic variants can basically arise at almost any stage of, of development and be uh, shared broadly across the body and sometimes be restricted to, uh, to one organ. And so we know that at birth, uh, the brain has this polyclonal uh, architecture. But what was not known until recently was whether without this vulnerability of cell division in post-mitotic neurons, do mutations continue to accumulate permanently marking cells and potentially permanently impacting cell function? Or is it just that there's a steady state level of DNA damage repair active in, in uh, post-mitotic cells in the brain throughout life? And so in order to test this hypothesis, we, as I said, expanded our, our, um, our data set to include infant, adolescent, adult, and, and age brains. And we applied the same, uh, muta the same uh, mutation profiling techniques that I described earlier, isolating neuronal nuclei, amplifying their genomes, and performing whole genome sequencing. 
For this study, we focused on two areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, uh, as we did in our earlier study, and also the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, because we know that uh, the hippocampus is an area of, a uh, focal area of age-related dysfunction and, and disease, and we wanted to know uh, how different neuronal cell types might uh, accumulate mutations differentially during aging. And so, together with an MD-PhD student, a former MD-PhD student, MD PhD student in the Walsh lab, Rachel Roden, we collected 117 normal uh, single neurons from 15 normal cases. As I said, that ranged in age from uh, infancy to almost age 83. We had 91 neurons from the prefrontal cortex of these cases, and, 20, and work really led by Rachel, uh, 26 neurons from the dentate gyrus of six of these cases, was allowing us to compare somatic mutation patterns within the same brain, so controlling for genetic background, environmental exposures, and other idiosyncrasies uh, of these cases. And um, in another great collaboration with Peter Parks Lab at Harvard Medical School, we uh, developed a new mutation calling algorithm that's called LIRA for linked read analysis. I don't have time to go into the uh, specifics of how LIRA works today, uh, but suffice to say we can rule out a whole series of, of artifacts associated with single cell sequencing uh, related to the, the ampl uh, amplification artifacts that arise during uh, WGA, as well as single-stranded lesions that might exist on the DNA before we even start amplifying using read-backed uh, Happel-type phasing. So if anyone's interested in, in uh, talking about mutation calling with Lyra uh, afterwards, please find me. So armed with our uh, expanded set of samples and our new mutation caller, we can finally answer this um, old question of whether somatic mutations accumulate in the human brain during life. And we found indeed in the prefrontal cortex that they do. So I'm showing you all of the PFC neurons that we profiled here uh, arranged on the x-axis by their age, color-coded by case, and on the y-axis we can see the number of SNVs per genome. And we can see that in our youngest neurons, uh, they range between three to 900 point mutations per genome with an average of around 700. And this number rose linearly over time, just that our oldest PFC neurons had around 2,500 point uh, mutations in their genome, so almost a fourfold increase during life. We also saw a linear increase in somatic mutations in the DG during life, like in the PFC, with some heterogeneity across cases and even within a brain. And while both of these uh, increases uh, over time were significant on their own, the slope of these two trend lines was different. So we can tell that uh, in the PFC, neurons experience around 23 point mutations per genome per year, or about one in every two weeks of life, whereas that rate was almost twofold higher in the dentate gyrus with about 40 point mutations accumulating per cell per year, suggesting that some underlying differences in the biology of these cells is either driving differences in the rate of DNA damage or the rate of repair uh, by the DNA damage repair machinery. And so what is the consequence of this linear accumulation of mutations over time? So we know that uh, somatic mutation isn't totally random, and I'll talk a little more about patterns uh, of somatic mutations in, in a moment, but for the most part, the chance of any one locus obtaining a hit uh, is about even. And we know that, um, and using our data, relating the number of somatic mutations present in the genome and the number of predicted deleterious mutations that we found, um, we were able to extrapolate uh, the rate of accumulation of, of potentially damaging uh, mutations and the, and the chances of hitting the same uh, locus twice. And this is basically the, this probability of coincident events is, is the same principle as this birthday probability problem, whereas you uh, accumulate people in a room, you surprisingly quickly uh, have a pretty high chance of hitting the same birthday twice. And so using this, this, uh, this framework, we're able to uh, extrapolate that at, at, uh, the, the chance of generating these biallelic knockout mutations uh, rose exponentially during life. So that our oldest neurons in the dentate gyrus, which had around 4,000 point mutations, uh, we might expect one in 1,000 neurons to have a biallelic knockout, suggesting that at least in principle, somatic mutations could be interfering with uh, neural function uh, during aging. And so it's sort of interesting to think about the, these numbers and, um, and, and how they relate to the variation that we see across individuals. So by adulthood, if we estimate around 1,000 point mutations per neuron and the 80 billion neurons that we know exist uh, in the human cortex, that's around 10 to the 14th neuronal mosaic variants present in the brain, which completely dwarfs the, the average number of variants that would distinguish any two brains sitting uh, in the audience today, suggesting that you know, really the, there's this universe of genetic diversity uh, within the brain that I think is important for us to sort of um, study and understand. And I think it's an exciting time to be in the field. 
So the next question we want to ask is whether somatic mutation rates are altered in, in disease. So we focused on two specific diseases, cocaine syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosum. Both diseases are caused by germline loss of function mutations in uh, genes responsible for nucleotide excision repair, so DNA damage repair genes. Both uh, CS and XP cells uh, have defective um, clearance of oxidative DNA damage, oxidative damage being a known hallmark of aging in the brain and in other systems. And so it's not surprising that in both CS and XP, uh, one of the major symptoms is accelerated aging in the brain and severe and progressive neurodegeneration in the cortex, resembling the degeneration you might see in a, a, ver uh, a very old individual. Um, but it happens much earlier with CS being fatal um, in early uh, adolescence, whereas individuals with XP typically survive to adulthood. And in work led by another MD-PhD student in the Walsh lab, Mike Coulter, we profiled somatic mutations in 42 neurons uh, from nine prodroid cases, including six CS cases and three XP cases. And what we found was that indeed somatic mutation burden was elevated in both CS and XP relative to age match control, suggesting that when aging is accelerated, so is the acceleration of somatic mutations, suggesting that these two processes are really intimately linked both in normal aging and in pathological aging. And so finally, we were, wanted to think about signatures of somatic S and Vs and whether that could tell us something about aging and disease. So what do I mean by mutation signatures? Well, we've known for some time that in cancer, mutation signatures can reflect discrete mutagenic processes. So I'm showing you a citation here uh, from a landmark paper published in Nature a few years ago from the Cosmic Consortium. So this is a consortium of, of cancer genome uh, researchers that sequenced tumor and normal pairs and compared mutations in the tumor relative to, to normal. And in doing so, they were able to identify 30 mutation signatures. And I'm showing you one signature here that they called signature seven. So like all the signatures that, that they identified, it's composed of uh, the six uh, principal kinds of mutations. So C to A, C to G, C to T, T to A, T to C, T to G, but then subdivided into the five prime and three prime base of, of these mutated sites because we know that those surrounding bases can strongly influence the kind of biochemistry that goes on at those sites. And so, as I said, one signature that they found was called signature seven, which is compo composed almost exclusively of C to T mutations in specific contexts. Specifically, uh, C to T mutations in dipyrimidine tracts, where a C directly preceded by another C or T. And we know that biochemically, dipyrimidine tract mutations can be caused by exposure of DNA to UV light. And signature seven is enriched in skin cancers, the incidence of which is correlated with exposure to the sun. Another signature that they identified is called signature four, which is enriched in C to A mutations. C to A mutations can be caused, again, biochemically by attack of DNA by oxygen-free radicals or exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons present in tobacco smoke. And signature four mutations are enriched in lung cancer. So this is a proof of concept that one can study the, the types of mutations present in the sample and then infer the pathways that are causing those mutations and maybe present, uh, present us with ways that we can control those mutational processes. So we applied a similar logic to our data and in work uh, led by uh, Daniel Kwan from Peter Park's lab at Harvard Medical School, um, it, it told us that our data was most parsimoniously explained by three signatures. And I'm showing you this, these three signatures here. So the first we called signature A, which was composed of C to T and T to C mutations of, of various trinucleotide contexts. The second was signature B, which was almost exclusively C to T mutations, uh, but a uh, signature that we interpret with uh, with some degree of skepticism because we know that these C to T mutations are the most common artifact mode of whole genome amplification. So we are, you know, as I said, always thinking about ways that we can improve our, our pipelines here. Uh, and the third signature, signature C, had representation of many, many different kinds of uh, mutation classes. What jumped out to me initially were these C to A mutations in blue, which as I said, could be linked to oxidative stress, a known hallmark of aging. And so then, like in cancer, we wanted to know how these mutation signatures distributed across the cells we analyzed. And we found that signature A uh, was correlated with age very strongly. So the number of signature A mutations present in a neuronal genome um, didn't have anything to do with whether the cell was from the PFC or the DG, whether it was a normal neuron or a disease neuron. It correlated with the age of that neuron. And interestingly, signature A, when we did an unbiased clustering analysis of our signatures that we derived de novo, and these cancer cosmic signatures, we found that it correlated most closely with a cosmic signature called signature five. Signature five uh, is 
uh, thought of as a clock-like signature of aging. So the number of signature five mutations present in the tumor didn't correlate to where, whether that was a breast tumor or a pancreatic tumor, but only the age of onset of that tumor. So our work is uh, telling us basically that this clock is active not just in mitotic cells that can give rise to tumors, but also in post-mitotic neurons, suggesting that it's independent of cell division. Our second signature, signature B, was basically flat during aging. So mutations accumulated with age, but the number of signature B variants stayed exactly the same, suggesting that whatever generated signature B uh, was active before the collection of our youngest neurons, which were infants, and then uh, became inactive globally. The signature B was enriched in the dentate gyrus relative to uh, prefrontal cortex, and it increased slightly in the DG during aging over time, suggesting that that whatever mutagen was, was creating those mutations during development became restricted to the DG postnatally. And our third signature, signature C, um, had a weak but significant correlation with aging in, in normal cells, but was really highly enriched in our prodroid uh, diseases, CS and XP, suggesting, um, as the literature sort of told us, that the proteins that are mutated in these diseases are important for keeping oxidative DNA damage in check. And so uh, to wrap up, I think you know, we're all very familiar with how germline variants can tell us about evolutionary history and can influence traits across individuals. And I think now with the advent of single cell uh, genomics, we can use somatic mutations to tell us very similar things inside the body. We can use somatic mutations to trace lineage, and I think inside the brain, and also I'm really interested in applying this technology uh, outside of the brain and, and other developmentally interesting tissues like, uh, like the muscle, and we can use mutation counts and mutation signatures to tell us something about the underlying biology of cells. And, and if we think mutations are, are important for, for aging, then we can think about using signatures to tell us how we can control uh, mutations during life. And so um, many people to thank. I, I, I mentioned many of these people during the talk um, from uh, Chris Walsh's lab, uh, my postdoc mentor, who's been a, really a fantastic mentor throughout my postdoc and continues to be, as I said, in my lab at, at UMass Medical School. Uh, many people from uh, Peter Park's lab at Harvard Medical School, and Peter, who's been a fantastic sort of second mentor to me. Um, we get a lot of our tissue from the Maryland Brain Bank, uh, so we're very thankful for them and their expert sort of pathology team and all the donors and the families of donors who so generously donate their tissue uh, to make our work possible, uh, and funding from NIH and, and UMass, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, we'll take questions, but please wait for a microphone to come to you before you start uh, asking. Hi, Michael. Hi. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, I just was wondering if you could comment on what somatic mutations uh, do say or m might theoretically say in the future about adult neurogenesis. Yeah, I think um, it sort of will be a function of, of uh, how efficiently you can capture somatic mutations at a wide scale across aging and what you think that ra underlying rate of DG neurogenesis is. Um, so if it's, you know, it's, if it's on the order of one turnover per lifetime, that's going to be difficult to find with somatic mutation, somatic mutational lineage tracing. If it's more common, then, then it might be. I had also wanted to ask about DG uh, adult neurogenesis, but I had a second question about the signature B that you showed that looked like it was uh, almost exclusively the C to D mutations, which are the ones you were worried about maybe there being experimental artifacts. That was also the one that has no variation with age over the patient, uh, which is also what you would expect if it's something that's a, an experimental artifact, right? It wouldn't correlate at all with uh, the age. I wonder if, if that... Uh, those two facts somehow lessen your, your uh, confidence in that particular data point, or if there's some other factor that I'm missing? Yeah, no, I think yeah, you hit it on the head that, um, so one way you can think about experimental artifacts is them being universal across the data set. Another is you might think about lower quality samples having a higher burden of those. Um, so basically we see that signature B is almost universal across the data set. It's enriched in DG and, can, and seems to increase slightly in DG during life. Um, but we're, we're definitely thinking about parallel technologies that we can use to complement our single cell whole genome sequencing that can tell us whether or not signature B is, is artifact and how, or how much of it, it may be artifact. So maybe that's like a, an ultra deep sequencing of, of many of the mutations that we found in, in tissue and we expect some of them to validate you know, in a nearby, if they're developmental, they should validate in some other cells nearby. So that's what we're thinking about. We have a question down there. 
There's one up on the other side. Oh, and a question up top, sorry. Oh, it, it seems like some of your cells have uh, really high mutation rates. Do you know what's going on there? We don't. So we had one, our most mutated cell in this data set at least, was from a uh, middle-aged brain, so 42 years old, so not one of the oldest brains, and it had around 7,000 point mutations per genome. Uh, it was highly enriched for this signature C, this oxidative stress signature. So one hypothesis that uh, we haven't been able to test yet was that this cell was undergoing some type of oxidative stress crisis, and maybe we caught it before it was going to undergo apoptosis or something like that. So if the mitochondria are basically heteroplasmic or mosaic within a cell, would this technique work? And if so, what signature would you expect to see? Would it be signature C, the oxidative stress? Yeah, so we might expect to see that. Um, we can't see mitochondrial genomes with this technique because we're purifying nuclei. Um, but yeah, if we can figure out a way to, to purify mitochondria and even sort of look at the individual mitochondrial genomes within a mitochondria, I think that'd be really interesting. Great, any other questions? Uh, oh, one more in the middle. Can you just wait for the mic, please? Thank you. The first two questions were about adult neurogenesis. Does that, for a layman, translate into what the differentiation of stem cells into new cells in learning is? Uh, is that, that, it seems like it'd be a similar process, but that's what I know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's, so there's the hypothesis that essentially across most of the brain, uh, the number of cells are fixed at birth, so you have a certain number of cells that you're born with. Um, but in some areas of the brain, there could be a residual population of stem cells that continues to divide uh, and give rise to new cells. And, and one area is the hippocampus, which is the center of learning and memory. And, and there's a lot of data, at least in, in mouse models, that learning and, and exercise and a lot of different things can modulate the level of that activity. But it's controversial whether in humans and to what degree that neurogenesis is going on. So. Uh, I, I guess you'd say s constructive somatic differences. Oh, yeah, so that, I, can't, I can't really answer that, but I think I, my working hypothesis is that most of these mutations are bad and disrupting functions, and um, the chance of getting one that's, that's uh, positive for function is, is very low. Okay, okay. thanks, Michael.